right, I'll open us in prayer. Lord, we thank you today and we come before you because you are good. Your steadfast love endures forever, over and over and over again. And so, Lord, today as we come into your presence, may the joy of the Lord become our strength. As we go today, Lord, let nothing come in between you and us, Lord, because you have set us free. And who the Son has set free is free indeed. So no one can tell us otherwise. No lies of the enemy, no schemes of the enemy can tell us otherwise. So be with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen! Amen. Yesterday we talked about foundations. We talked about getting your roots set on the right place and uprooting the lies. And we're going to continue to attack those lies. But you remember the three plumb line images we talked about yesterday that are crucial to our life? Number one is the image of who? God, right? Number two is the image of? Uh huh. And then the third one is the image of? Others. That's right. Wow, you guys remember. Praise the Lord. <laughs> so today I want to focus for this session on why I can't trust God with my whole heart. Why I can't trust God with my whole heart, and how can we soften our heart towards God? And you know, it's funny because we're in church so much, and we're always told, trust God. You know, lean not on your own understanding, but trust in the Lord with all of your heart. And again, you're going to be Pastor Joe, those are some sweet, sweet words. But I got some trust issues. Who has trust issues here? Ooh, a lot of us do. But this is what the Lord was speaking to me. Because what the enemy wants to do is this. He wants to come into your life. He wants to steal, kill, destroy, mess everything up. And then he wants to blame it on God. And then what happens is we start blaming God. And when God is supposed to be your protector, your healer, your deliverer, you have this thing against God. And you can't trust him. So you push him away. And even though your pastor is such a great pastor, preaches the word of God, really shepherds you well, you just can't trust the Lord. Because the enemy does not want you to know that he is good. People blame God for the works of the devil, and people especially blame God when other Christians don't represent him well. So I want to show you guys an example. So let's see. Oh, can I get that one more time, please? <laughs> There's some spiritual warfare right here, y'all. Keep the prayers up. I think I touched the computer a little bit. It like fell asleep. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Oh, I didn't even turn this off. I mean, on. All right. Oh, yeah. Whoops. This was the first one. Do you guys, can you guys see that? Oh, someone said it. Who said it? Yeah, that's Beethoven, okay? So Beethoven was this great composer. So this is what happens sometimes. Say I take Beethoven's uh, Piano Sonata number 23, and I am not a classically trained pianist at all. The only song I know is River Flows in You by Yoruma. And it's only because when I was a youth student, I wanted to impress all the girls. So I learned that one song. But let's say I took, I took the note, I took the music sheet, right? And I bring it over here where a lovely Pastor Grace plays, and I lay it down, and, and then I can't, by the way, I can't sight read either, and, okay? If you guys don't know what that is, it's all the little circles and lines on the music sheet. And so say I put it there and I start playing. It's gonna sound terrible. It's gonna sound terrible. I'll probably start playing River Flows in You instead. But do you know what would be a very, very weird thing for me to say? It's to say Beethoven was a terrible composer. He's just a bad composer. That's not true. He's not a bad composer. I'm a bad player. I cannot represent his piece perfectly. I cannot represent his masterpiece well at all because I cannot play it perfectly. Do you see in the same way, just because other Christians are hypocrites does not mean God is not good. He is the master composer, but none of us can live that life perfectly. That's why Jesus came down. And that's really important for us to remember because so many of us rely on our teachers, on our pastors for our faith. But you don't need to do that. And we immediately blame God because of the hypocrite Christian. We're like, dude, 
I don't go to church because this guy said he was a teacher, but then he did this. We're all sinners. We cannot represent God perfectly. So what does that mean for us? It means that you should not look to your leaders and your pastors to see who God really is. You know, actually, you don't need to because Jesus died for you so that the veil was torn and the presence of God was open so you can just come, hi, God, and speak to him yourself. Why would you want to go through a secondary channel to reach God when you can go straight to him? When you can approach him? So just because Christians aren't able to represent God's love or mercy well, it does not mean that God is unloving or unjust. The veil was torn so we can approach his throne. You know, in Hebrews 4.16, it says, Therefore, let us boldly approach the throne of grace. The throne of grace. And you will receive mercy in the time of need. Guys, you know, when I moved to uh, California, um, <laughs> so I'm from North Carolina, you guys don't remember. And when I moved to California, one of the biggest changes for me was the food culture. Oh my goodness. Uh, you know, this is a little sidetrack, but so the only Mexican food in uh, North Carolina is Taco Bell. So when I, I know, I know, Mark, Pastor Marcus is like, oh gosh, Pastor Andy, who did you invite here? <laughs> so the only Mexican food I've ever had in my life was Taco Bell until I came here. And so when I came here, you know what someone offered me? They offered me, not a banana, they offered me a tamale. Okay. The tamales are good, right? But what happened was this. I didn't know, I didn't know what a, a tamale was. So the closest thing it looked to me was a burrito. So you know how I ate it? Like a burrito. So someone gave me a tamale, and I went, and I like went, I went politely to the bathroom, and I spit that thing out. And I was like, what are you eating? And then that happened two more times. And then I went to my, my, my roommate, Victoria, our children's pastor that I showed you a picture of. She's Puerto Rican. So I go up to her, hey, Pastor Vic, do you like tamales? She's like, I love tamales. And I was like, how do you get past the outer layer? And she's like, Joe, you're not supposed to eat the outside. And I was like, oh my gosh. So then I ate it for real. And I was like, this is the best food ever. I was like, God, oh, you're so good. And there's another food. There's another food that I really like, and it's pho, okay? Oh, Who loves pho here? Yeah. yeah. Californians are all foodies. That's one thing I realized. You know, you guys, you guys, you guys live to eat. I, no, you guys, you guys eat to live. Was it? Is, no, I eat to live. You guys live to eat. Yeah, that's what it is. So you guys love food. But pho, I love pho. And one thing I realized when I came to California is there are these pho restaurants. All of these, oh, pho restaurants, pho 21, pho 94, pho 45, pho 33. I'm like, why are there so many numbers? What do those numbers mean? But one thing I realize is it just says pho and it says a number. So when I'm driving and I'm like, I'm craving pho, where am I going to go? I'm going to go to a pho 33, a pho 45, a pho 21, a pho 94. And when I walk through that door, what am I going to expect to get? Pho. Oh. I'm not going to expect a hamburger. I'm not going to expect... McDonald's. I'm not going to expect a hot dog. I'm going to expect pho because it's literally named pho. So when you come before the throne of grace, what do you expect? So many times we expect judgment, condemnation from God. Oh, you're not good enough. Oh, you got to do better. But his throne is called the throne of grace. Why else do you think in Hebrews it says, therefore let us approach boldly? The only person who can approach God boldly is one who knows that grace is coming. Grace is coming. If you are afraid to step deeper into those heart of lies that you've been feeling from last night, even to today, just remember when you come before the Lord, His throne that you're coming to is a throne of grace. Amen? So don't rely on other people for your faith. Your pastors are not perfect. I'm not perfect. And you will end up getting hurt because you idolize them. But Satan's job is to pervert the 
the, the image of God. So he'll steal, destroy, and then blame it on God. But if you perceive God as your enemy, our hearts will protect us against God. But God is not our enemy. He's our protector, deliverer, and healer. And so there's one reason why we are losing so much ground. There's one reason why that life is not working. One reason why we've got all these issues. It's because we don't see the real battle that's going on. The reason why I keep asking you to ask God, what is the truth? What is the lies? Is because you need to see the real battle. If you know what you're fighting, then you actually know what you're fighting. It's pretty, it's pretty simple. But if you're, just, if you're going out there in the dark, it's pitch black, and you're like, all right, fight. You're just going to start swinging in the midair, shadow boxing. You don't know what you're fighting against. But look, this is what Ephesians, sorry, Beethoven, Ephesians 6, 12 says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Who do you count as your enemies? Sometimes we count each other as our enemies. Sometimes someone does you wrong, and you're like, oh, you're my op now. I'm never talking to you. I know, right? I'm so in with the times. But so often, our battle is against one another. But what you don't see is that the enemy is using that person to hurt you. The enemy is using your parents to hurt you. The enemy is using your teachers, your teachers, even sometimes even your pastors, to hurt you. But what you don't realize is the battle is not against one another. It's not against flesh and blood. But one thing you have to realize, the enemy is working. He is a, he's a grand, grand scheme. He's got these plans. You'll never see them coming. You will never see. He's so tricky. He is so, so tricky. You know, he's so tricky to the point the enemy doesn't even care if you go to church. Did you know that? The devil doesn't care that you go to church. Oh, that's scary, right? Because some of us are like, I go to church, so I'm saved. I go to church, so I'm a Christian. If you go to McDonald's, are you a hamburger? <laughs> if you go to Dunkin' Donuts, are you a donut? Just because you go to church doesn't mean that you're a Christian, my friends. Because what the enemy wants is for you to go to church and not really be saved. So your whole life, you believe that I'm saved. But then when you die, and you're not really saved, ooh, that's scary. Because that's eternity apart from God. So what's important is, not that we come to church, but that we really know who God is. We really know this battle we're fighting. If you can get this, if you can understand, whenever someone hurts you, whenever someone does something to you, and you step back a little bit, you cool down a little bit before you like say anything really mean, and you really understand, okay, that guy or that girl is being used by the enemy to attack me and my identity right now. That is not the truth of who I am. That is not who I am. If you can get that, you'll be equipped for the struggles that come in your life. You know, it's so funny. When I started ministry in, uh, I was like second year in college, uh, Oh no, freshman year. I, so I had a really bad breakup uh, on my, in my college freshman year. Uh, it was three days before my birthday and one week before finals. My girlfriend broke up with me. It was tough. And so what happened was I, those five weeks that like, I, I got broken up, the, not five weeks, the five days after was like, so college, once you guys get there, um, there's these days before the exam. There's exam week, and the week before, they actually don't give you classes. So you can just study, or you can just play. Depends on how much you care about your grades. So I, I got broken up with during those, those the five-day breaks, and what I did was I just laid in bed for five days straight. I was so sad. It was depresso espresso. And what happened was I, I ended up going to take my, my calc test, and like, I was already like, not doing well in calc. And all I needed was like a, I think like a 50 to pass with a D, okay? Try, just trying to get by with a D. I got a 39 on my file. <laughs> and I failed calculus with a 59%. And I started my, my freshman year with like a two point something. I know some of you guys are like, oh, Pastor Joe, you're not Asian. <laughs> <laughs> but I say that because in that year, God met me after that. I went to this one retreat and I got blown away. So what did I do? I was like, I prayed the dumbest prayer. I should have I never prayed this prayer. And don't ever pray this prayer. 
I prayed this. Lord, let me suffer more so I can be closer to you. <laughs> Six months later, I'm like in the most burnt out that I've ever been in my life, serving in ministry. And I'm bitter at everyone. I'm bitter at my students. I'm bitter at my pastor. And then God spoke to me, Joe, do you remember your prayer? <laughs> oh! That's why! See, struggles will come in your life no matter what, but unless you are prepared adequately, unless you know who you're fighting against, you're just going to be pummeled over and over and over again. And guess what? Your life will become a cycle. Sin, come back to God. Sin, come back to God. Sin, come back to God. Sin, go to the next retreat. Sin, go to the next retreat. Over and over and over again. But if you understand the battle that you are fighting, you will continue to fight well. And you're like, okay, Pastor Joe, that's great, but... When we talk about God, what about when bad things happen to me? You know, it's easy to say, like, oh, I got a flat tire today. Oh, it's okay. God is good. God is in control. Oh, man. Dude, I'm going through a, a tough time with my girlfriend, with my boyfriend. Don't worry. God is in control. God is good. But, you know, me and Pastor Andy went on this uh, mission trip last year in the winter. Oh, and Pastor Kevin. What do you say to a young teenage girl who's been sexually abused by multiple people of her family since she was six years old? You dare go up to her and say, God is good, God is in control. Do you know what she will think? If God is good, why would he let those things happen to me? If that's who God is, I don't want anything to do with God. So what do we say then? And you guys might face this question too. When you guys are in the public school, people are going to be like, well, what about this? What about that? Everyone wants to question your faith. It's this. So many of us, we mistake God's sovereignty for control. You got to really get this. God's sovereignty versus God's control. Okay? This is what sovereignty is. Sovereignty is absolute ownership of. It's a state of being in the highest authority and it submits to no higher authority. But the way sovereignty governs is through delegated authority. We'll talk about that later. And it offers choices with consequences. I'll say that one more time. Sovereignty is the absolute ownership of the state of being in the highest authority with submission to no higher authority. It governs through delegated authority offers choices with consequences. But this is what control is. Control is absolute dominion over. Governing through manipulative power, it forces people in circumstances to conform to the will of the one who is in control. Control removes the choices of others. Control acknowledges only one will, the will of the controller. God is sovereign, but God is not a controller. And we'll, I'll, I'll expand on this. We and others, we have free will, and we and others make choices. But do you know this? God is sovereign, but he has limited himself on planet Earth in certain ways for a period of time. This is what many Christians don't know. We, we always think, oh, God is, God is in control of everything. God is sovereign over there. He knows exactly, and he can do anything he wants. Actually, there's one thing that God has given authority over to, that he actually has limited himself. And we'll find this in the phrase delegated authority. Here's what it means. Um, Genesis 1, 26, well, this is just 28, okay? So this is in the beginning. God was creating everything. And then uh, after he made man and woman, he says, God blessed them. And he said to them, be fruitful, increase in numbers, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over every living creature that moves on the ground. So what did God do? He actually delegated the authority of the earth to who? To us. To humankind. To Adam and Eve. So God gave man authority. He delegated authority over earth to man. And this is what it says in Psalm 8, 6. It says, you made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet. Psalm 115, 16, the highest heaven belongs to the Lord, but the earth he has given to mankind. The authority is the right to use 
power, is the right to govern. And listen to this. Legitimate delegated authority means this. Legitimate delegated authority is not violated by any higher authority. Let me show you an example. So, imagine I own this really nice condo. I'm a, I'm a multimillionaire, in Jesus' name. That, and I own this condo. And then I rent out at least one room to Pastor Andy. That's your room, Pastor Andy. Sheesh! <laughs> so, even though I'm in complete ownership of this condo, and I completely own this one too, if I lease, if I lease this, this room over to Pastor Andy and I give him the keys, can I just come in whenever I want? Mm, that would be a violation. Because this is me delegating authority to Pastor Andy. And no and legitimate delegated authority is not violated by any higher authority. So if I legitimately, legitimately want to give authority over to Pastor Andy, I'm not going to come in whenever I want. I'm not going to come in and just grab a water from his fridge or grab food from him. That's wrong. So what happens is God delegates the authority of earth over to us. But what happens? Is Satan comes and he, he steals it. So we, we know that Satan caused Adam and Eve. He tempted them to sin. And when they sinned, what they actually did was they gave authority over to the enemy. So that's why when we gave the authority over to the enemy, it allowed him to set up his kingdom of darkness. It results in sickness, disease, and death. So how are you going to answer that question to that, to that teenage girl? We're not going to say God is in control. He doesn't want to control that. That's not his will for you. That's the last thing that God wants for you. Because he loves you so much. But the reason he limited himself in this way for a set period amount of time is because God is a God of love and he gives you choices. But because Satan came, he set up his kingdom of darkness and sin came into this world. That's why these evil things happen, because people have choices to do good or bad. See, the biggest, one thing my sister, so I'm the only Christian in my family, and I love you, April. Uh, the, the one thing my sister asked me is like, but Joe, if, why can't God just make everyone love him? Why can't God just make everyone worship him? I mean, then wouldn't the world be in a better place? You think, I guess. But there's no choice in that. If your mom forces you to study all the time and like force you to love them, do you really feel like loving them? No. Who likes to feel controlled? No one does. And why God gives us choices is because he loves us. So when we're in that room, even though the enemy, so we're in this room, the enemy is coming to attack us, doing these things to us. It's not God's will, but because God has delegated authority, and delegated authority, legitimate delegated authority, no higher authority will violate it. Those things happen not because God wills it to happen. Maybe in your life things have happened to you. But you need to understand that God did not want that to happen. That was not God's will for you. But there is hope for us because Jesus came. Jesus came and he died for us. He had a redemptive plan, God. He died for our sins. He rose from the dead and he took the authority back from the devil. And Jesus gave the authority back to us because the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, it says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, to Jesus. And then he says, therefore, go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded. Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. I, when I first learned this, I was, I was so baffled. Oh my gosh, God limited himself. That's such a weird thing to hear. Because God, God can do everything, but he, lacks, he actually lacks one thing. 
to accomplish his purpose on this earth. Because he has the power, he has all the power in this world through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the agent of God to do things in this world. He has all the knowledge, he has all the wisdom in this world. And he has all the love that you could ever want. But God lacks the authority that he gave you for his will to pass on this earth because he wants to partner with you to bring his kingdom. Did you know that? God actually wants to partner with you and that's why prayer is so important because when you pray, do you know what you're doing? You're, you're combining your authority that God gave you in his power and that's, what, that's how you bring heaven down on earth. It's such an important thing to know. So when we talk about this standard, this plumb line of God, one thing we need to realize, the things that happen to us, it's not God's will. Because that's usually where all the hurt from God comes from. That's where, oh, this happened to me, God. Why would you let that happen to me? You're in control. Why would you let that happen to me? God is sovereign. He's not a controller. Because if he was a controller, he would make sure those things don't happen, but he would also make sure that you love him no matter what. Every thought of your mind, praise Jesus, praise Jesus. Every feeling, praise Jesus, praise Jesus. But you and me both know, especially the pastors here, we both know that not every day is like that. There may be days where we go without even reading our Bibles. Ooh, We need to repent. <laughs> I need to repent. <laughs> so, what happens though? How can we soften our hearts towards God again? I want to show you something. Um, so this is what happens to us when we get hurt. Um, so this is a diagram. Uh, when we get hurt by something that happens in our life, when we get hurt by someone, when we get hurt by God, what do we do? We instantly put up the shell of protection. And what happens? Why we put that up is because we're afraid to get hurt again. We're afraid to get hurt, so we put up this defense. And what we do is we block out the hurt that comes from outside. We block out that comparison that your mom always compares you to that one person. Because we don't want to hear it. But do you know what happens? When you block out the hurt, the other thing that you're blocking out is God's love as well. When you block out hurt in your life, you're also blocking God's love for you. And you're wondering, why can't I feel God's love? Why can't I receive blessings? I mean, have you ever been, if you've ever been hurt by your parents before, and then they try to do something nice for you afterwards, you can barely look them in the eye. Well, I, I wonder if there's a time, but I, I know my mom has definitely hurt me before. Everyone's mom has hurt them before. And then she'll be like, come eat food. And I'm like, and I just eat, and then don't look. Because when you get hurt by someone, you can't receive love from them. So it's not only towards someone, but if you, if you interpret your life experience as you getting hurt by God, guess what? You're going to be blocking God's love out too. And that's why I share this whole thing, because God's will is not for you to get hurt. That was not his will for you in your life. So then... What do we have to do? Because these are the walls that are motivated by fear. We keep further hurt out, but we also keep God's love from coming in. Our defenses in our hardened hearts are cured when we realize that nothing that you've ever done or that someone has done to you will change who you are. It's all about identity. Because why this hurts so much, why this hurts so much is because we feel like our identity is being attacked. We're worthless. We're not valuable. We're not lovely. We won't amount to anything. We're never good enough. I, I, was, uh, I had a dinner with a, a brother of mine recently. Um, not, not my brother with the cat, but with an, another, another brother. And he was just telling, us, telling me a story. He was going to a family dinner. And then they said something so hurtful to him. They basically were talking to his little sister, and they were just like, oh, yeah, you should go. Bad advice. Okay, don't listen to this advice. They're like, oh, yeah, just go and date whoever you want to date. Go and party. Go have fun while you're young. You're in college. And then this is what they said after. You don't want to end up like your brother, do you? Wow. In my friend's words, he says, 
he felt like he caught a stray bullet. That hurts. Maybe you guys have caught stray bullets in your life. You were just going about your day. You are just having a good time. And then your mom goes, hey, why don't you study more so you can be more like your cousin? Boom, stray bullet. Sometimes that hook just comes out of left field. And it messes you up. It messes you up. You know what the stray bullet looks like? It looks like that. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, Lord, what is the stray bullet? It looks like that. It's from Mario. But this is a question then. How do I react to these stray bullets that come to me? When the hurts of life, when someone comes to offend you, because like I said, suffering will come your way. Don't pray it into existence. That's the one prayer God will always answer. <laughs> You can do three things. This is the death missile. Everyone say death missile. Death missile. Yeah, that's the death missile. It comes, the hurt comes your way, and you can react in three different ways, okay? Number one, you harden your heart so you protect yourself from external death. Like this, Wakanda. But what happens is inside, it releases an internal death. It releases bitterness, hatred, anger inside. Number two, you can do this. You can leave your heart open. Jesus. And let the death just boom, hit your heart. Dude, you'll get destroyed. I'd rather choose the first option than the second option. <laughs> or, number three, you can let the death missile pass through you into the cross of Jesus Christ. Because, look, all of the hurts that people have done to you, guess what? They cannot pay you back for it. They cannot pay you back for it. When someone's hurt you and you have this anger and bitterness towards them, what you really want is you want revenge. You want vengeance. But guess what? Even if they apologize to you, sometimes you're just like, that's not enough. Pay me back. Where's my reparations? No one can pay you back for the hurt that they dealt you. Only Jesus can pay for those things. Because that death missile is intended to destroy your identity. But if you let that death missile pass through you, you go, whoop, matrix that thing, and it goes straight into the cross of Jesus Christ, you don't need to feel the offense. Because Jesus will take it for you. You can soften your heart without that fear anymore. You can actually open yourself to receiving love. I mean, some of us are so bad at receiving love, especially us as leaders, especially us as small group leaders and pastors. The, you, know, you know, this is the one thing that, that pastors don't tell you. Sometimes the reason why we want to be pastors and we want to lead is so that we don't have to be vulnerable. Ooh. Sometimes it feels safer being a leader because you don't actually have to share your feelings. Oh. Oh, I'm getting goosebumps, y'all. I'm preaching to myself. Can I hear an amen? amen? Oh. Because we're so afraid. But this allows you to open your heart up. Open your heart up to really receiving. Because some of us, especially us Asians, we, we do everything for other people, but the moment they do something for us, they're like, no, 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 no. Have you ever fought for the check before? Oh my gosh. Oh, I hate fighting for that check. I'm just like, all right, you pay. All right, you pay. They're like, they're like, like the, the food is ending and then they're, they're coming up. They're like, and they're like, oh, oh. I'm like, okay, cool. Free meal for me. Thank you, Jesus. That's your will, Lord. But it's because we feel like we cannot receive because we feel like we have to owe something. And that feeling of having to owe, oh, that feeling is rooted in shame. It's rooted in you believing that you're not worthy of receiving love. Because those death missiles have hit you over and over and over again. But I'm telling you, no longer do you need to take them. You, you let them pass right through you into the cross of Jesus Christ. So if I can have the praise team come up, if someone can get them from outside, uh, they can start. 
I want to share with you guys uh, just a little story as we close and we wrap up for this session. So when I was, uh, I think, in high school, when I was a senior in high school, um, I was dating this one girl. But what happened was she ended up cheating on me. And it was one of the worst pains that you will ever feel in your life when someone that you love so much would betray you. And that was a pain that I knew very well. That was the mega death missile. That thing, my heart was open, vulnerable. Why well, I got some trust issues? It's because I got so hurt. But more, do you know that it's actually not about what happens to you, but it's about how you interpret it. I said this yesterday. It's not about what happens to you, but it's about how you interpret it. So when I got cheated on, do you know how I interpreted that? I interpreted that as, oh, I guess I'm not worth anything. I guess I'm not lovable. I guess I can never be the man that she wanted me to be. Those were the lies that began to be implanted into my heart. Those hurts will come your way. But do you know how Jesus healed me? He spoke this to me. He says, my son, I was at a retreat just like this. He says, Joe, do you think I don't know what betrayal feels like? Whoa. And I, immediately he took me to the cross of Jesus Christ. And he says, look, you have been dating your girlfriend for what? Seven months. My followers, my disciples were with me for three years. When I went on that cross, they all left me. It wasn't just Peter who denied Jesus. Everyone ran. And he says, Joe, I know you're hurt. And I forgive those disciples. He redeemed Peter. He redeemed Peter. You remember he was cooking on the beach? Let him cook. And he redeemed Peter. The three times Peter denied him, Jesus redeemed him three times over. Do you not think he can redeem your life too? The very hurt that you've gone through. You ask him, Lord, do you know how I feel? And he will say to you, my daughter, I do. Because I have gone through everything that you have gone through. And so I said, Lord, if you can forgive your disciples of three years who followed you day and night and betrayed you, then why can I not forgive my girlfriend who cheated on me? That night, God shifted my heart. Because one thing I realized, what she did to me, it doesn't affect my identity. I am still God's son. I'm still loved by God. My identity never changed. So you know what I did? Very next day, I messaged, I messaged the guy who she cheated on me with. And I said, hey brother, what, what you did was wrong, but I just want you to know I forgive you and I love you. And I bless you in Jesus' name. He didn't understand what, what, I, was, what I was saying. He didn't understand because he wasn't Christian. But I knew. I can do that. Why? Not because I'm a good person. But because Jesus forgave me so that I can forgive others. Do you know if you want to be forgiven, you need to forgive others? those who have wounded you, those who have hurt you. And I was able to go to my girlfriend and say the same thing. I even asked her for forgiveness. I said, please forgive me for holding anger and bitterness towards you. And I forgive you, I release you. One night, just one word from God, all, all the anger, all the bitterness, all the hatred, it was gone. I didn't struggle with it, like going back and forth anymore. Because after, the, break, after the, our, the initial cheating and the breakup, I was so angry. I was so angry all the time. But in that moment, God released me because he said, my son, 
that is not your identity. And he's saying the same thing to you. Whatever God right now is bringing up that memory, that hurt, he's speaking to you. My daughter and my son, that is not who you are. Forgive as I have forgiven you. He has given you that kind of authority to partner with him. That is his will. He will be the one to fight your battles for you. You do not need to be the perfect son. You do not need to be the perfect daughter. You do not need to be the perfect brother or sister or leader. Why? Because Jesus has been that for us already. So would you just take that off of your shoulder and lay it before the Lord? Soften your heart without the fear that you will get hurt because the fear, the hurt is not directed towards you. There was a really uh, crude example that, that I remember a pastor was talking about. He goes, he, he goes, imagine there's a dead donkey right here. It's just a dead donkey, okay? And he goes like this. He runs up, he just kicks that thing. And then you're like, whoa, 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 what are you doing? And then he asked, he, he asked me, you think you can feel anything? I was like, no, technically, no, it's dead. You can kick it all you want, but it's not going to feel anything. Do you know the Bible says that we are dead to our sin and alive in Christ? So when the enemy comes, the world comes, and he wants, and it wants to kick you, guess what? You don't get offended anymore because you're like, oh, I'm dead to my sin. I'm dead to the old ways of my life because I am new in Christ. So come what may. Come on, mate, bring your, bring your attacks on me and I will show you. This is the life that I have now in Christ. You can live a life that's unoffendable. It's possible. You can live a life of not being offended by anything. In this world that gets offended and triggered by everything, you can be the light and you can show people. You can criticize me all you want. You can hate me all you want. You can say the nastiest things about me all you want. But that is going straight to the cross of Jesus Christ. When I started ministry, all of my friends that I grew up with in the church, do you know what they say to me? You've changed, Joe. You're a hypocrite. You talk like you're so holy. I'm like, don't you want to change? Do you want to stay like this forever? But you know what I did? I didn't say anything back to them. I let them talk on about me all behind my back. It hurt, it hurt. But you know what the greatest thing I can do for them is? It's to live a life that is worthy of the gospel of Jesus. Because one day, when they really begin to see who Jesus really is, they will remember, someone lived a life that was worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. May your life be a living testimony to those around you. You are called to be the light of this world. A light on a hill, it cannot be hidden, my friends. So don't let, don't be discouraged by your friends. Don't let the things of this world get to you. Because you are called to be an example. If you, if you stand out, that's good. Don't be like other people. God has created you for who you are. Why would you want to be someone different? You are so precious and so special to God. Be that light. Because then the world will know. John 13, by the way that you love one another, the world will know that you are my disciples. How else will we bring other people into the kingdom of God? If we don't show, this is the real thing. I mean, why would, you want, why would you want counterfeit? If you, if you want to come to church for good music, I'm sorry. This is, not a, this is not a, we're not a band. I tell my youth kids, y'all, if you were musicians, I would never hire you. But if you're a true worshiper, no matter what you sound like, you can be tone deaf. But if you have a heart of worship, you're, you're in. You're in. If you want to come to church for great speaker, great music, why don't you just go to the world for that? I mean, it's better anyways. 
Don't you think this world can make better music? Yeah, I'd rather go to that concert. Don't you think the world has better motivational speakers? Just go there. But if you want Jesus, come to church. If you want Jesus, come to church. So I want you guys to stand up. I know. And I want you guys to just close your eyes. And I want you to just ask him this. Say, Lord, what do you want to do today? What do you want to show me today? What do you want to speak to me today? Can you show me? And just listen to him. Jesus is the one who conquered it all, and God is the only one with the authority to tell you who you are. So when those death missiles come your way, they might even come on this trip. Let them pass through you and into the cross of Jesus Christ. He is your champion. He has gone before you. And you stay by him. You stay by his side. He will protect you. He will guard you no matter what comes your way. And so, Lord, I just bless Every son, every daughter, every brother, every sister here in the name of Jesus, I bless them with your intimacy. I bless them with assurance, with safety in knowing that you are the God who protects them. You are the God of ages who stand before them. You are the ancient of days. And you are stronger than all of their fears. You are stronger, so Lord, you speak to them. You make them feel the safety that they have been wanting for so long. The security that they've wanted for so long. They will not find it in people. They will not find it in this world. But Lord, they will find it in you. And so I bless all of you with that security in Christ. This blessed assurance that He will never let you go. Even if you Run away from God. He will not let you go. I bless you with His love, with His grace and His mercy, with the energy and with the joy of the Lord that will become your strength, not only today, but for the rest of your life. You will live a blessed life because that is God's plan for you. You will not live as a victim anymore. Because He is setting you free. And He will make you a blessing to others. You will become leaders to lead other people into Christ. That is who you were made to be. You will be sons and daughters who are cherished for who you are and not what you do. God will separate your identity from your actions and He will pour His love out over you. So Lord, I thank you All this glory goes to you. And I bless you all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.